All right. Today is Thursday, March 10, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and we got a lot to talk about, so let's dive right into it. In focus tonight. Buck up. Stop complaining about inflation. You're all big boys and gals. You can take inflation. Inflation is good for you. Folks, we have a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of clown, absolutely clueless, talking about inflation as if they know what they're talking about. In this channel, we've been talking about inflation for over a year. I've been predicting that we will have an inflation crisis in this country that will perhaps dwarf the great inflation in the 1970s. And I also warned repeatedly in this channel that when inflation becomes a problem for the consumer, it will get political and the misinformation will come out of the woods from all over the place. They're now saying that inflation is due to the Russians. Putin inflation. What a joke. Inflation has been going on for over a year now. They're saying that inflation is due to price gouging from oil companies. Really? Have you seen the prices of oil, crude oil in the futures? WTI, Brent? I guess Chevron and Exxon are manipulating these numbers higher? What a bunch of fools. Inflation has always, always been a monetary phenomenon. What does that mean? There is only one party that is responsible for inflation, and that is the Federal Reserve, the root of all evil that nobody wants to talk about. Not the media, not the politicians, not anybody. Why? Because they want to keep the Federal Reserve as an enigma to the American public. Inflation has always been born when the Federal Reserve increases the money supply, meaning printing more money out of thin air and stimulating an economy that doesn't need stimulation or overstimulating the economy by printing more money. And I made a video about inflation a few months ago that got about a quarter million views. It's an unorthodox approach to explaining inflation, but you're not going to hear that explanation anywhere in the media. You have to remember, when the thing crisis hit back in 2020 and the stock market dropped due to panic selling, the economy is going to shut down, we have an unknown virus. There was a lot of panic at the time. The Federal Reserve seized the opportunity and rescued the stock and real estate markets, the assets of the wealthy, by unleashing the biggest tsunami in the history of monetary policy by printing trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. The majority of these trillions went into propping the stock and real estate markets, making the rich in this country richer. So to save the assets of the wealthy from panic selling, the Fed printed all of these trillions of dollars, and now we're facing the ramifications of that printing, which is inflation. You have the biggest tsunami of liquidity in the history of this country. Well, there is a price to pay, and the price is the biggest inflation in the history of this country. You can go back in this channel, the videos that we made a year ago, even more than that. We've been talking over and over and over again about the risk of creating inflation, the reckless monetary policy to prop up the stock market, to create this massive bubble that made the rich richer. That's all what it achieved. It did not really save the economy. The economy is already falling apart, even after trillions and trillions of dollars were added to the public debt of this country. Nobody was paying attention back then. Matter of fact, they called inflation transitory. We told you in this channel, it is not transitory. There is no such thing as transitory inflation. And now here we are. We have one of the biggest inflation crises in this country's history. And they're politicizing inflation because the White House, the Democrats, are being blamed for this inflation. So they have to use propaganda and nasty tactics to shift the blame. They tried to do it on price gouging by greedy companies, quote unquote. That is not working out. It is not landing. They now found another boogeyman to blame inflation on. Putin. It's Putin inflation. When I said in this channel a long time ago, the biggest political enemy to the Biden administration is Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. What did Joe Biden do? He renominated his biggest political enemy, Jerome Powell, who continues to be so callous and so reckless about inflation. To this day, the Federal Reserve continues to buy bonds, continues to buy mortgage-backed securities to prop up the stock and real estate markets, producing more and more inflation. To this day, the delusional madman Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed, remains in latter land, so unattached with the reality. And instead of raising interest rates right away to tackle this inflation, he wants to wait and see. He wants to be so gentle when it comes to raising interest rates and normalizing the monetary policy. 
he wants to approach it with white gloves, because God forbid stocks would go down and the rich start complaining again. He's still waiting for the miracle that inflation will end up being transitory, but we have all evidence out there pointing that this inflation will only move higher and higher and higher. So this is the message that I wanted to get out of the way because there is a lot of misinformation out there. But let's talk about the CPI that we got today in gas prices. We start with this, the New York Times, another propaganda piece by the way, they came out last month, February 11th, and they said, inflation may have already peaked and the Fed needs to step gingerly. The Fed needs to be careful, because God forbid they crash stocks. Inflation is already cooling down. This is according to the New York Times. And I told you in this channel, the trajectory for inflation is higher and higher and higher. It's not going to stop. Absent of a Volcker-like approach by the Federal Reserve, by increasing interest rates dramatically, which will produce a massive recession. Recession is the remedy for inflation. It has always, always been that way. And what do you know? Today we got the new CPI reading. And boy, were the cooks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics busy, busy, busy in the morning. Busy doing what? Cooking a tamed down reading of inflation. And this is what we got. CPI inflation went higher by 7.9% year over year. This is the highest rate of inflation in 40 years. And of course, when the cooks at the Bureau say that inflation is around 7.9% year over year, you have to assume that the actual rate of inflation is 17.9%, or let's say 18%. So you add 10 to whatever the cooks give you. They say it's 8%, it's 18%. If they say it's 9, it's 19%. Because the CPI formula is flawed, they don't account for rent inflation. Rents are surging higher across the country by more than double digits, yet this is not accounted for. The CPI says rent inflation is around 3% year over year. Are you kidding me? Inflation in certain cities already exceeded double digit inflation, and this is according to the Cooks, by the way. Whether we're talking about Phoenix, Miami, Baltimore, Atlanta, and even here in San Diego, inflation is at double digits according to the CPI. So when they say inflation is at 10% in Phoenix, it's actually 20% or even more. And this is morphing into the biggest inflation crisis that this country has ever seen. We're seeing inflation moving higher, be it in services, goods, food, stunning inflation in food prices, energy, all moving higher year over year in a stunning fashion. And this will become a cost of living crisis. The standard of living is under attack. The purchasing power of consumers is being crushed because they have to choose. Do I spend on goods and services? Do I go out to eat? Or do I spend on gas or groceries? Take, for example, online grocery prices, which went higher by 7.6%. And this is before delivery costs. But perhaps the biggest crisis when it comes to inflation these days is the insane prices we're seeing at the pump. Gasoline prices are surging out of whack. You're seeing what's going on in the oil market. WTI surging, Brent surging, we have an oil embargo against Russia right now. This will take out millions of barrels out of the market. We have a massive supply problem on top of the monetary inflation that has been pushing these oil prices higher even before the war or the embargo. AAA says that the majority of Americans will alter their driving habits due to the insane gasoline prices at the pump. We're now averaging more than four bucks a gallon nationwide. But it gets even more disastrous in California, where I live, because we're seeing prices exceeding seven bucks at the pump. Thank you, of course, to the reckless policy of the Federal Reserve, the reckless policy of the Biden administration, but most importantly, the reckless and stupid policies by our governor, Kim Jong-un Newsom, the dictator of California who enjoys a one-party rule with no competition at all. We have insane taxes right now to punish the oil and gas industry when it actually punishes the consumer, not the oil and gas companies, to support the so-called green energy. The approach from California government is the following. You feel bad about gas prices at the pump? Poor you. It's your fault. Why don't you buy an EV? like the rest of us, you know, the elite living in San Francisco, Hollywood Hills, and Malibu. Why couldn't you be like us? And that begs the question, by the way, where is the Republican Party in California? They completely gave up on the state of California. The Republican Party is incompetent and pathetic. You have prices spiraling out of control, crushing consumers in California. We have a homelessness crisis all over the place. And it's getting worse and worse by the day. 
we have a crime wave, the likes that we've never seen before. Crime is all over the place. It is pretty much wide open. The state is on a silver platter, politically speaking, for the Republican Party to capture. But are the Republicans doing anything at all to even try and attempt to compete in California? Of course not. Last time they gave us Larry Elder, when they could have nominated a cockroach, an actual cockroach, to be their nominee, and he would have beaten Newsom in the recall election. But they didn't even try. All what we need is somebody to point these problems to Californians. Are you okay with paying seven, eight bucks at the pump? Are you okay with the homelessness all over the place? The filth that's going on all over the place? Our infrastructure is crumbling, potholes all over the place? Waste of taxpayer money all over the place? Are you okay with the wave of crime that is going on across the state? This is all what you gotta say and present the solutions and boom. But make no mistake, it might not be that easy because we live in a corrupt state where the media is pretty much owned by the Democratic Party. The LA Times, the San Francisco Chronicles, they're all in the pockets of the Democrats. They're going to attack anybody who questions the tyranny of Newsom. And don't forget the zombified voter who continues to vote for these mummies who've been in power for decades. Feinstein, Pelosi, they've been in power since the pyramids were built. No checks, no balances, and this is what we get as Californians. The most insane gasoline prices in the country. And look at Joe at the pump, taking a selfie, right? Gotta send this to Barack. Hey Joe, you're the president now, there is no Barack. And by the way, let me fix this for you. Here we go, these are the gasoline prices right now. And I forgot to Photoshop diesel, so get those while they're still cheap. Look at gasoline prices, all time highs. This comes hand in hand with gasoline futures also reaching all-time highs. So if you say that inflation is due to gas companies' price gouging, how do you explain the fact that gasoline prices at pretty much all-time highs? They buy the commodities at the future market. They don't set the price. The oil is dug out of the ground, it is refined, and then it's sold at the market price. You buy it at the market price. You don't make up the price. So again, this price gouging bullshit, this is just an excuse to cover for failed policies. Of course, we have companies doing some sort of price gouging. Not just oil companies, but consumer product companies. Go to the grocery stores. Prices are moving higher. Why does this happen? Because we have something that we call inflation expectations. When inflation expectations are moving higher, as the CEO of any company, oil company, Procter & Gamble, consumer staples company, railroad company, my job as a CEO to stay ahead of inflation because the moment I fall behind inflation, that is the moment where the company could lose money, the margins could go down, profits could go down, and your duty as a CEO of any company is to produce profits. Are we complaining about capitalism right now? The CEO of the company, oil and gas company, or any other company, is not the CEO of the Salvation Army. Their job is not charity. Their job is to produce profits. Whether we like it or not, these are the rules of the game. And they've been here forever. And of course, you have to notice that the Biden administration right now is attacking oil and gas companies, not any other companies, even though the price gouging is also happening across the board. Why? Because oil and gas companies stopped donating to the Democrats, and to the Biden administration long time ago due to the hostile policies against the fossil fuel industry. The Democrats figured out that they can make money from the green energy billionaires, the so-called renewable energy billionaires, and they stopped taking money from oil and gas. But we have price gouging even in the green energy industry. Solar prices are going higher. EV prices are going higher. Isn't this price gouging or not? If you want to be fair, you got to be fair across the board and call it for what it is. It is price gouging, but they're doing it across the board to stay ahead of inflation. This is the nature of any inflationary period. When inflation expectations move higher, you got to stay ahead of those expectations by jacking your prices higher. It becomes a vicious cycle of inflation, a feedback loop that feeds within itself. And I've been warning and warning and warning in this channel that this will happen, and we're already here right now. How come the Harvards and the Yales of the world, the Goldman Sachs and Black Rocks of the world, who are occupying the White House right now, how come they never caught up to this, that we will see inflation due to the reckless policy of the Fed? How come a douchebag YouTuber who barely finished college got it right from the get-go? One must ask the question, why? And I'll tell you why. The Harvard, the Yales, the Goldman Sachs, the Black Rocks of the world occupying the White House right now 
They were interested in politics. They were interested in politicizing everything. And they did not mind when the Fed was recklessly printing money because it was propping up the stock market. And they wanted a higher stock market heading into elections. Every administration wants that, but they forgot about the price to pay. Me, on the other hand, I read the facts, I use logic, and I come up with the conclusion. I let the chips fall wherever they may. They're favorable to the politics I believe in or not. Doesn't matter. The facts are the facts. You're going to print money out of thin air to to prop up the equities market to make the rich richer and have higher stock market, there is a price to pay and this is inflation. And unfortunately, inflation punishes the poor and the middle class the most, as you will see in this program. And now that we have a new boogeyman in Putin, the Democrats, the Biden administration figured out a new trick. Let's blame this inflation on Putin. A matter of fact, when the stock market crashes, let's also blame that on Putin. As if inflation was not going on for over a year right now. Who do you think you're kidding here? Do you think that we're really that stupid? They're also saying, hey, the pain at the pump. Come on, man. Come on, man. Buck up and take it. For Ukraine, the dollar you're paying extra at the pump, that goes to Ukraine. You're helping Ukraine. Last time I checked, Ukraine was not a member of my family. My job is to put food at the table for my family, for my household. An increased cost of living does not help me at all. And by the way, how is punishing the American consumer, the poor, the middle class, the households of this country, helps Ukraine at all? Would you have Germany, as we speak right now, buying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of gas from Russia every single day? Will we have China buying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of oil and gas from Russia every single day? How are we helping Ukraine by punishing the people of this country, the working class of this country? And of course, unfortunately, what happened to the Democrats as of late, they became a weird combination of the Hollywood elite and the Bush era neocons who are obsessed with war. It's absolutely stunning to me what happened to the Democratic Party. They became way out of touch. Matter of fact, cheering and ridiculing blue collar, the poor, and the middle class of this country. Look no further than this clown Colbert and what he said a few days ago about the pain at the pump. Take a listen. But it's going to cost. Since the invasion, oil prices have skyrocketed. Today, the average gas price in America hit an all-time record high of over $4 per gallon. Okay, that stings, but a clean conscience is worth a buck or two. I'm willing to pay. It's important. It's important. I'm willing to pay $4 a gallon. Hell, I'll pay $15 a gallon because I drive a Tesla. <laughs> I have news for this clown. This obsession with the so-called green energy, which is not that green, by the way. Look at lithium, nickel, and cobalt mining pollution, the child labor, and all of the issues that goes with that. But regardless, crushing the fossil fuel industry and make it less incentivizing to be an oil and gas producer is reducing the supply of oil and gas across the globe. And this is pushing inflation higher. You combine that with the monetary inflation, all of these trillions have to chase something, and they're chasing oil and gas commodities because this is exactly what you're supposed to do as an investor when we have inflation in the economy. It's always been this case, and now you got massive inflation in oil and gas prices. And this obsession with green energy has another inflationary side, where we have a surge of demand all of a sudden on EVs and the batteries that go inside these EVs. Now you have a surge of demand on lithium on nickel, on cobalt, on zinc, on aluminum, all of the materials that go into the production of batteries for EVs. It's not just American auto manufacturers doing it. It is European manufacturers, Chinese manufacturers, Japanese manufacturers. Everybody's competing for these resources. And these resources are limited, by the way. We have to develop these mines, lithium mines, nickel mines, cobalt mines. We have to find copper, aluminum, zinc, and this surge of demand is pushing the prices of these materials higher. And hence, the prices of these EVs are also moving higher, significantly so. So when this clown Colbert says, what do I care about the price of the pump? I drive a Tesla, and if you don't like it, just buy an EV. Your gas guzzling poor middle class bums, just get yourself an EV. Well, look at the prices of EVs versus gas combustion engines. The average selling price for an EV right now, due to the rise of prices of nickel, aluminum, lithium, the average price of an EV is around $60,000 versus the price of a traditional car, a new car, not an EV, around $40,000. Again, how do you expect the poor and the middle class to shell $60,000 on average 
to buy an EV. They cannot afford that. A lot of them make less than $60,000 a year. A lot of them rely on used cars. They already have their cars. They cannot afford to buy a new one. And their cars happen to be gas guzzling cars. They're enduring massive pain at the pump. These are bus driver, grocery store workers, janitors, gardeners, regular folks, blue collar folks, the backbone of this country. And they're being ridiculed and made fun of and being gaslit that the inflation that you see at the gas pump is due to Putin. And oh, by the way, you should be proud of paying more at the pump because you're helping Ukraine. What a bunch of crap, you delusional lunatics. And by the way, where is the supply of EVs and even hybrid vehicles? They're nowhere to be found at all. Look at the inventory of EVs and hybrid vehicles across the entirety of the United States. We only have a little over 2,000 vehicles of the Ford Mustang Mach-E across the country. And by the way, this is a new vehicle that has a lot of problems. The reliability is another problem. As a consumer, do I buy a Mustang Mach-E or do I buy a Camry, a Corolla, an Accord, Civic, something reliable that I know? But look at across the board. The inventory is nowhere to be found. This is the truth. For example, my wife is right now looking for a Subaru Crosstrek hybrid. Look at the inventory. Nowhere to be found. We tried to look all over the place. We cannot find it. I found one and the guy's asking for $49,000 for it. That is insanity. You want to talk about price gouging? Here it is. So we're going to stick with the regular Crosstrek that uses a gas engine. We have a lot of European viewers who say, what is the big deal? Americans are complaining about seven, eight bucks a gallon here in Europe we pay a lot more. Here's the difference. We drive a lot. My wife drives 100 miles pretty much every single day. So yes, there is a lot of pain at the pump. And when you spend more in gasoline, you're not going to spend more doing economic activities, dining out, buying goods, services. You might even have to reduce your eating habits because it costs more at the grocery store. For example, they're now telling us that you have to eat less meat because meat is so expensive. Just eat less meat. Oh, and by the way, let them eat EVs too. I guess by eating less meat, I'm sticking it to Putin, right? What a bunch of morons. Cheap all over the place. And for the out-of-touch elite, here is some reality for you. One in three Americans are driving less right now. Why? Well, 57% say due to higher gasoline prices. And these higher prices, this inflation, this insane, out-of-whack inflation all over the place, everything you buy, everything you consume, these prices are going higher. A lot of Americans decided not to purchase items due to higher prices. For example, when it comes to new cars, pickups, SUVs, 51% said they did not buy due to higher prices. When it comes to housing, apartments, 50% say higher prices was the reason behind not buying. Restaurants, takeout food, 49% said it was higher prices behind the reason not to consume there. Gasoline, fuel, 48%. Furniture, 44%. Electronics, 42%. And it goes on and on and on. You combine that with the supply chain problems, when it comes to paper goods, paper towels, 56% said, we did not make a purchase because the item was not available. And this is going to lead this economy into stagflation. Prices are moving higher, while the economic activity of consuming is moving down, stagflation will evolve into a recession. Because to tackle stagflation and higher prices, the Fed will have to raise interest rates aggressively. And by doing so, when they slam their foot in the brakes because they've been behind the curve for too long, they're going to crash this economy and dip it into a recession. And this is the result of this reckless financial engineering of the economy by the Federal Reserve. According to the University of Michigan, the majority of households are becoming less confident making large purchases because prices are moving out of whack. The spending on durables is pretty much below the peak of the pandemic panic in 2020. You think this is good for the economy? You think this is good for the stock market? Of course not. Most consumers who are contemplating big ticket purchases opted not to buy. 74% opted not to buy a new car, pickup, or SUV. 71% opted not to buy a used car. 68% opted not to buy a house or lease an apartment. And the list goes on and on and on. But look at the bottom of this survey. 10% opted not to buy gasoline and fuel. That tells you it is a necessity. They don't have the luxury not to buy fuel and gasoline. This is hurting the average Joe and Jane specifically the poor and the middle class, because their wages are not keeping up with inflation. Net, net, the majority of Americans are actually down. They talk about wage inflation as if it is a good thing. 
Be thankful that your wages are higher. This inflation is good for you. Look at your wages. Are we that stupid? Net net, when you factor in the increases in wages versus the increase in rent, gas, groceries, net net, you're losing money. A lot of Americans are quitting their jobs. And over 60% of those who quit their jobs last month said it was due to low wages. The majority of those said it was a major reason behind quitting their jobs because it doesn't make sense anymore. They're not getting paid an equitable pay to the growth rate in inflation. It doesn't make sense anymore to work when you're losing money. Does anybody want to work at a job where you're losing money? Of course not. No wonder why we're seeing workers across the board quitting their jobs. And here's an important fact. About 50% of those who quit their jobs also listed child care issues as a reason for quitting their jobs. This is not a surprise when you look at babysitting prices, the average hourly pay for babysitting, which is nationwide at almost 20 and a half bucks an hour. And this is, of course, getting, uh, you know, Kim, the neighbor's daughter, teenage daughter, to babysit your kids. That's 20 bucks. You want to get a professional babysitter who's not going to do only fans while babysitting your kids. That'll cost you an arm and a leg. But hey, it's all worth it. It's all worth it so long as you're sticking it to Putin. What a bunch of clowns. But the gaslighting continues in a shameful way. Listen to the senile, delusional Treasury Secretary, who used to be the Fed Chair, by the way, Janet Yellen, who came out today and said, Inflation is bad, but wage gains outstrip prices at the low end of the scale. Really? According to a Bloomberg survey, across all income levels, just 18% of consumers said their wages were keeping pace with the higher cost of living. Are you aware of that, Madam Yellen? Of course not. Not in the reptilian world that you guys live in. In February, 73% of low earners, the low income earners, these are folks who earn less than $25,000 a year. They said that they felt the impact of inflation. 70 3% of those, only 9% said their wages kept with the cost of living. Are you hearing this, Janet Yellen? Of course not. But in the elite bubble that they live in, well, higher earners were about three times as likely to say their wages had kept pace with inflation at 31%. So even among high earners, only 31% say that their wages kept pace with inflation. But those households with incomes of over $100,000 or more were better able to cope with this inflation that just hit 40 years high. So we have an economy that works tremendously for the rich. By the way, $100,000 is not really that rich. With this inflation, that is pretty much borderline mid-income. But the economy has been phenomenal for the billionaires the corporate insiders who made billions and billions of dollars from this inflation, from the reckless monetary policy by the Fed. But we have the poor, the middle class, the working people of this country being punished right now and being gaslit. But inflation is good. You should embrace it because you're helping Ukraine. You're punishing Putin. Here is the reality, folks. 64% of Americans are now living paycheck to paycheck. Are you hearing this? Criminal insider trader Jerome Powell. And it gets even more painful for retirees, seniors who have no other choice to combat inflation. They have no options left. They cannot change jobs. They cannot ask for a better pay from Social Security. Their retirements, their savings are being crushed. They're struggling with the cost of living increases. A senior in San Diego, 75 years old, with multiple health issues that keeps him largely housebound. In the past, his power bill was around 250 bucks a month, but his most recent bill shot up to 508 bucks a month. Tell this guy that it is worth it to stick it up to Putin. It's not. And inflation has been going on for a long time now. It is not due to the war. Once again, it is due to the reckless policies of your elected beloved politicians and non-elected beloved Fed zombies. We're now so desperate, Janet Yellen, who says, but inflation is good because the low income earners are beating inflation. Low earners, Mrs. Yellen, 57% of those say that the tax refund is either moderately or very important to their financial health in 2022. They cannot do without the tax refund. This inflation, folks, is crushing small businesses in this country. It has been good for Amazon, good for the big tech oligarchs, good for Walmart, good for McDonald's, but not good for small businesses. High inflation has become very deflating for small businesses, the NFIB says. The largest number of small businesses since 1981 say that high inflation is their chief worry, and many are increasing prices to offset their own rising costs. 
optimism among small businesses fell in February to a one-year low. This is according to the National Federation of Independent Businesses. But rest assured, with all of this havoc in the economy, inflation crushing small businesses, crushing the poor, the middle class, with no end in sight, on top of that the gaslighting and the ridicule that the poor and the middle class have to endure, the elite, the media, the politicians, your beloved clown labor secretary said, aside from inflation, we have a really strong economy. <laughs> And rumor has it, T-Rex said to the dinosaurs, aside from the asteroid, we're gonna do just fine. And now the criminals at Wall Street and the business news media, they're arguing to Jerome Powell, the Fed chairman, the criminal that he is, not to increase interest rates because of Russia-Ukraine. Lots of uncertainty in the economy. We cannot hit the stock market by increasing interest rates. God forbid, folks, the Fed is way behind the curve right now. This will morph into a hyperinflation crisis, if not stagflation, absent of the Fed acting right now. Next week, they must act. They must act decisively by sending a message to this economy that the Federal Reserve cares about the economy, not the stock market. The Fed cares about tackling inflation, you can demonstrate that by being serious about it, by admitting that you were wrong about transitory. Now you will do whatever needs to be done to tackle inflation, even if it means raising interest rates dramatically, and even if it means that Wall Street, the stock market, loses for a little while. The problem is, folks, after years of financial engineering by the Fed, we have become an economy that traces the stock market, not the other way around. It used to be, back in the day, that the stock market traced the economy. The economy does better, the stock market also does better. But now, after years of financial engineering, done by design, by the way, we have an economy that does better when the stock market does better. And when the stock market crashes, the economy also follows that way. So unfortunately, we're out of choices. We're out of options here. We are in a lose-lose situation. Either the Fed acts to tackle inflation, and by doing so, they're going to crash the stock market, and this will cause the economy to crash and cause a recession, perhaps a deep recession. Or the Fed does nothing and remains careless about inflation because it is not the right time. We have Russia, Ukraine. Watch inflation grow larger and larger and larger to become a hyperinflation problem, maybe a stagflation problem that will eventually force them to slam on the brakes and raise interest rates aggressively anyways. But when that happens, the crash in the stock market that was supposed to be 50% from the highs will now become 80% from the highs. The recession that the economy was supposed to endure will now become a depression. This is the result of the incompetency that we have across our government and the Federal Reserve. But folks, the hope is here. We have to end in a positive note. The hope is here. What is the hope? More and more people are becoming aware. More and more people are listening. and They're realizing what's going on and they're demanding change. And this is the only glimpse of hope that we have to continue to hold on to. And with that, folks, we got to move on to cover the market information for you. And we start with the performance of indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average was down 112.18 points, or a decline of 0.34%. The Nasdaq closing down 125.58 points, or a decline of 0.95%. The S&P 500 was also down by 18.36 points, or a decline of 0.43%. What about the sector's performance today? A flip image of yesterday, the dead cat bounce lasted for one day. Here we are, number one, capturing the gold medal, energy. Number two for the silver, materials. Number three for the bronze, utilities. The laggards of the day led by technology, communication services, and defensives. What about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE, 46% advancing versus 51% declining. The NASDAQ, 36% advancing versus 58% declining. What about commodities? Really funny action in oil. It goes up, it goes down, lots of volatility here. But the assumption is the rally will resume sooner or later. The problem is we have funny activities like somebody pouring in over $80 million in inverse indices against oil right before the Russian embargo hits. I'll leave that for you to interpret whatever way you see fit. But here it is, WTI was down by almost 2 and a 3 quarter percent. Brent was down by a little over one and three quarters of percent. Gasoline was down by almost four and three quarters of percent. Heating oil was also down the same way, 
while natural gas propped higher by 3% today. Softs, we have gains for lumber, a little over 1.25%. Likewise, we have gains for sugar, almost 3 quarters of a percent, while we have modest moves pretty much in the flat line for OJ, cotton, and cocoa. On the other hand, coffee remains the laggard so far, losing again almost 2.5% today. Metals, Modest gains for gold, silver was higher by a little over 1.5%, copper, similar story. Palladium did not move a lot, while platinum was the loser of the day, shaving off about 2%. Now, palladium is one of the indicators, but today the market did not care at all about the indicators. Matter of fact, the VIX was down, palladium down, gold did not move by a lot. Wheat was down, oil was down, yet equities also closed in the red. So was today a bear trap? Yesterday was a bull trap? Was it today the bear's turn to be trapped? We'll see. But it could also be a reaction to the CPI. We'll talk in the charts analysis. But here it is, meats. It was a down day for feeder cattle. Down almost 2.5%. Likewise, live cattle was down by 1% a quarter percent. On the other hand, the new big tech, lean hogs, down modestly almost three quarters for percent. What about grains, the hottest trade by far? All eyes on wheat, and wheat was limited down today, losing almost 10 percent. So the Russia-Ukraine trade underperformed tremendously today. On the other hand, we have gains, big ones, for oats over four percent, followed by corn, almost three percent gains for corns, Soybean meal also closing the day with gains of almost 2%. We have some modest gains for rough rice, soybean oil, and soybeans. Well, it was a down day for canola, shaving about 2% today. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. The hottest table by far today was Apple, with around 1.2 million contracts traded today. About 58% of those were calls. At number 2, Tesla, the souffle, with a little over 750,000 bets today, about 51% of those were calls. AMD at number 3, with around 450,000 contracts, about 58% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, we start with the ticker BIG, Big Lots. The name was down big today, and it is down big time year to date. Somebody's betting for more pain to come by buying the 30 puts for the expiration date, April 14th, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 14.5% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about two million dollars. What about the trades for the ticker QQQ, the Nasdaq? They're buying a call spread here, interesting. They bought the 355 calls and they sold the 365, all for the expiration date March 25th. With expectations that the queues could pop higher by more than 7% by then, but not more than 10%. They paid about 80 bucks for buying the 355 calls. They received about 20 cents apiece from selling the 365 calls. All in all, the entry cost is down to 60 cents apiece. And that brings the total for this trade to about a quarter of a million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker CVX Chevron? One of the hottest trades by far, so far, excuse me, but somebody's fading the rip by buying the 160 puts for the expiration date March 18th. Perhaps expectations of profit taking to come? And they're calling that CVX will be down by more than 6% by then. They paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.3 million. What about the ticker APPS? This is for Tribune Digital, or Digital Tribune. The name was down today, and it is down big year to date, losing almost 40%. Somebody's betting for more pain to come by buying the 35 puts for the expiration date, April 14th. With the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 8.5% by then, they paid about two bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.4 million. Lastly, what about the ticker ASAN? This is for Asana. The name was down big today, over 20% in the red, and it is down almost 50% year to date. Somebody's buying the dip this time around, somebody's betting for a rebound. In this case, they bought the 40 calls for the expiration date, March 18th, with the expectations that the name could rebound higher by more than 5% by then. They paid around one buck and 80 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $850,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here? We talked about Amazon, the stock split, popping the stock higher, the outlier within technology. All the big caps were down, led by Apple, 
This is alarming because as Apple goes, so will the market. But they sold the rip right away. Even I expected that the bounce will last at least for a few days before it fades. They faded right away. Technology down, financials down, the automobiles down. All the winners from yesterday are down. And they went back to the winners year to date. The big pharma names, railroads, UNP, Union Pacific was up. Deer, the fertilizer names, Mosaic, right away they bought the dip. They didn't even give you a chance to buy the dip. The miners, Valia was up, big energy names, Exxon, Chevron, even the refiners were up, Walmart is up, ADM in defensives, Archer Daniels, Kroger, the names that I liked were up today. They went back, the same winners, and they dumped the losers right after the bounce lasted for one day. The exception today was defense. Lockheed, Northbrook did not participate with the rest of the winners year to date. Is there something to read here? Who knows? But what we know for now is Germany will spend more in defense. We're talking about a minimum of $20 billion. Australia announced today that they're going to spend $20 billion plus in defense spending. So the tailwinds for defense remain intact. We also have more boycotts, more uh, suspending of operations in Russia, this time around from Burger King. And rumor has it, with all of these fast food American companies leaving Russia, the average Russian waistband went down by two inches. Moving on to the heat map for the ETFs this time around. Again, dumping the winners from yesterday, look at the SOXL, chips down over 6%. And the winner, back at it again, energy, materials were up. The peculiar part was the underperformance of the VIX. We'll look at the VIX chart, but look at the VXX, UVXY were down big today. Gold was up, mixed signals across the board. Very confusing. We will try to piece the pieces of the puzzle together. Now, when we look at international markets, the winner from yesterday, Europe, was down big. And China, what a load of pain. FXI, MCHI, all down big time. And watch out for European stocks because the euro dollar volatility is absolutely stunning. We are pretty much at the highs of the thing crash back in 2020. Look at the volatility, the VIX versus European stocks. The volatility in European stocks dwarfs the volatility that we have here in the US market measured by the VIX. So watch out. There are opportunities, of course, with volatility, but if you bid the wrong way, you will get crushed. On the other hand, you can look for the stability. The Brazilian ETF, the EWZ, the Canadian ETF, the EWC, and here it is. I also like the Australian ETF, the EWA, because Australia, just like Canada, is a rich resource country, which means with this inflation in materials and commodities, countries like Canada, Australia, Brazil will benefit tremendously. So stick with those and fade Europe. Moving on to the charts analysis, we start with SPY's chart, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart it was a bull trap so far because we got a gap down and we did not close the gap by the end of the day the good news for the bulls is the following we're still making higher lows the support of 422 remains intact the bad thing for the bulls and the good thing for the bears is the following what if the entire formation we're seeing right now is merely a bear flag consolidation a bear flag pattern Sooner or later, it's going to play down, and we will see the SPY revisiting 410 and a half. Another way you can see it clearly by using a line chart, this looks like a bear flag consolidation, at least in the bear's perspective. But the bulls should not be discouraged by that. You actually want the chart to go down or retest 410 and a half, form the double bottom, and then rally higher. Moving on to the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500, the volume moved higher on a mixed day. It was a down day, yes, all in all, but we saw some buying by the end. So the good news for the bulls is the fact that the volume is not moving higher by selling. So this could mean that we're seeing the sellers drying out. They were already dumped. They're done with the dumping, and this opens the path for buyers to show up again. Another good news for the bulls is the fact that 4,232 is still intact as support. The momentum indicators remain neutral, at least for now. They're not curling their way higher or to the downside. They remain in bearish divergence, at least in the MACD, but they could swing one way or the other. So for today, they remain inconclusive. And the bulls would argue, not so fast bears, because we're fixing the pattern. The pattern has lower highs and lower lows. So far, it appears that we're making higher lows. The bears would argue, it doesn't matter if you're making higher lows or not. If we switch to a line chart, what if this is 
reverse ABC pattern. We formed the A leg, we're now forming the B leg, and soon enough we're going to form the C leg, which will take, a take us down all the way to at least 4,102. Here's the 30 minutes chart for the Qs, the NASDAQ, also a gap down, not closing the gap by the end of the day. The bad news for NASDAQ bulls, unlike the SPY's bulls, is the fact that the support of 334 was not recaptured, opening the way that we could see more declines all the way to 316.46. And when we switch to a line chart, who's to say that this is not a bear flag consolidation? It's already breaking down sooner or later will be down to retest the lows. Here's a daily chart for the continuous contract for the Nasdaq. So far, we have a rebound from the yellow trend line, which was target number one. The good news for the bulls is the fact that we're not seeing elevated volume on a down day. That could be a sign that the selling is drying out. Likewise, the support 13,599 remains intact, at least for now. The momentum indicators are not curling down. They remain consolidating, at least for now. But the bears would argue if we switch to a line chart, the pattern is clear. We have lower highs and lower lows. Unlike the SPY, the Qs did not form a higher low, at least not yet, which means we could see more down days to come. What about the IWM small caps, the Russell 2000 30 minutes perspective? It performed a lot better than the Qs and the SPY. It was pretty much barely in the red today. And this could be a leading indicator that the bullishness is not completely out of the market yet. Yes, it was a dead cat bounce, but who's to say that the bulls are not done buying the dip yet? If we view the IWM as a leading indicator, the good news for the IWM is the fact that it pretty much closed the gap. We have to wait to see if it's going to trade above the gap or reverse. The other point for the bulls when it comes to the IWM is the fact that the support of 196.5 remains intact. The real reason behind the bullishness in the IWM small caps is the hope that the cyclical trade remains intact. We're done with the thing, we're not even talking about it, so who's to say that the consumer is not going to go out and splurge on goods and services with the juice that they have left in consumer spending power? We're talking about hotels, restaurants, cruises, casinos, so that is keeping the hope alive for the IWM and small caps in general. What about the Dixie, the dollar index? It was an upside day for the Dixie. Not reversing the reversal yet, we're seeing a mini correction in the RSI, the MACD, but the dips are being bought quickly, be it in the fertilizer names, be it in oil, be it in the Dixie, which is alarming by the way. It tells us that even with the technicals being overextended, it is not scaring the dip buyers away. The dip buyers believe that these names will continue to push their way higher because inflation is getting out of control and the Fed remains way behind the curve and this Russia-Ukraine conflict continues to add more fuel to the fire of inflation. Look no further than gold. Again, overextension in the technicals. We have a reversal candle, but even with that, we saw buyers showing up and buying the dip in gold. What would it take for traders to abandon these trades, the dollar, oil, weed, gold, palladium, and move back into equities? We have to solve this problem. In my opinion, it's not going to happen until the Fed issues a dovish statement, meaning let's raise 25 basis points, then we'll wait and see what happens. Or, Jerome Powell says, we will adapt to uncertainty, meaning, yes, we hike interest rates by 25 basis points, but if the economy slows down, we'll do a U-turn right away and ease and take the 25 basis points hike back. But absent of that, and regardless, to be honest with you, inflation will continue to move higher and higher and higher. The Fed not acting or easing by being dovish and saying instead of 50, we'll do 25 or maybe no hikes at all. They're just kicking the can down the road. The issue will be revisited at a later time. And at that time, the Fed will have to be more aggressive. Perhaps instead of 50 basis points increase, they have to do a full point. And that is the risk. Now, the question for gold as in Mosaic, for example, do you buy now or later? Here's my answer for you. I'm not going to tell you to buy or not to buy, wait, sell. All what I'm going to say is the following. Buying at extended technicals is risky, but these momentum trades could continue to move higher and higher and higher, and those overbought technicals could get even more overbought. But at some point, the technicals will play out and you will see a massive flush down. So you have to approach it from the bird's eye view. Look at the monthly chart for gold. This looks like a cup and handle formation, indicating that gold will move higher in the long run. So if you buy now, and then gold flushes down the very next day, and you're down 5-6%. In the long run, the chart says, you will be rewarded. So the buying decision is an individual decision for you to make. 
Factor in all of these points and make a decision. You can use creative strategies. Instead of buying the underlying stock that is overbought right now, you can sell puts. If the stock continues to move higher, you're going to make money from these puts expiring worthless. On the other hand, if the stock goes down, now you have the option to exercise your puts and buy it at a cheaper price. Another strategy that you can use in buying gold, mosaic, oil, all of these overbought stocks and commodities, you can buy in increments. So you buy a little bit now, see how it works out. If the stock goes down, you get to buy another increment at a cheaper price. If the stock goes higher, you have your confirmation that you're right and we have higher highs. You buy another increment. But if you go all in and you buy right away, that could be a recipe for disaster. Here's a daily chart for the 10-year yield popping higher today. Why? Because of the CPI showing higher inflation. We're now back at almost 2%. The RSI, the MACD, they're curling the way higher, indicating higher rates to come. This is what I call the NASDAQ dilemma. Even if the Russia-Ukraine situation cools down, and we have a cooling down in inflation expectations, the NASDAQ will have to face the hawkish Fed sooner or later. And these higher interest rates, in this case the 10-year yield, will squeeze the margins in the NASDAQ and the high multiple names. And therefore, 2022 is the year of Buffett, the year of value investing. You trade growth, but you own value in a year like 2022. What about the TLT weekly chart? Watch out here. It appears that it's going to lose 134.5 as support. The weekly closing is important. A closing below 134.5 will open the door for the chart to go down and revisit 128 for the first time in over two years. If we have a closing above 134.5, the hope is still alive for the TLT bugs. What about the VIX four hours chart? The SPY was down, but so was the VIX. So what is the message here from the stock market? We still have sellers, evident by the down day in the stock market, in this case the SPY. But are we seeing hedging and expectations of more selling? Well, at least according to the VIX, not really. Otherwise, the VIX would have closed in the green. Why didn't the VIX close higher? Why didn't market participants buy more put options with the expectations of more down days to come? It could be recklessness. It could be overconfidence. But this was a confusing part in today's tape. Now, what are the technicals saying in the VIX? The MACD indicator is now showing red impressions in the histogram, indicating that the pop since Monday is now over. The problem is, we don't have a decisive move to the downside in the VIX. It is still way above 20. And so long as we have weekly closing above 20 for the VIX, the bears remain in charge in the long run. So yes, the dip in the VIX could mean a pop in the SPY, but it doesn't mean all in all that the SPY has bottomed because the VIX has yet to top. And when we look at the daily charts, the weekly charts of the VIX, they're indicating higher highs to come. So we're using the four hours perspective to trade. But as investors, we have to look at the daily and weekly perspective. When we look at those, we haven't seen the end of the pain in the SPY yet. Likewise, here's a four hours chart for the VXN. We're seeing a mini baby crossing in the MACD indicator, showing red impressions on the histogram. They're not decisive yet. They could do a 180 right away. Likewise, while there was a down day for the VXN, the confusing message, of course, the pattern still making higher lows and higher highs. Who's to say that this chart's not going to pop higher again? The NASDAQ bulls should not feel comfortable until this pattern makes lower lows, which means trading below 32 and a half. We have yet to see that. But the fact that we have a down day in the VXN tells us that the hedging stopped at least for today. Perhaps market participants are brushing off the down day, shaking off the down day, and believing the bounce from yesterday. And that is evident of the buying we saw at the later part of the tape today. Does it mean that the bulls are right? But it means that they're still here and they continue to buy. Whether they're buying pies or not, so far they have been. They've been buying pies. Warm, nice pies right in the face. The question is, when do they give up? What will it take for them to give up and stop buying the dip? That is a question to think about. Let me know in the comments. But for now, we're moving on to the daily chart for Apple. Apple went down to retest 157 as support, and it's now back in negative divergence. Here's the problem with Apple. The negative divergence on the momentum indicators, but most importantly, look at the volume today. It spiked higher above average on a down day. As Apple goes, so will the market. It is the highest weighting in every ETF, at least every major ETF. We're seeing the NASDAQ, for example, holding on, not crashing, 
because this stock is holding on. But what if this stock starts to break to the downside? Moving on to Tesla, the Soufflein hourly chart. We have a confirmation that yesterday was a bull trap because the gap down today. The problem is, we continue to see buying of the dip in Tesla, aggressively so via call options mostly. Yet the bears would argue, today we formed another bear flag pattern, and we're gonna go down and retest the lows at around 728 and a half. The bulls would counter and say, wait a minute here, we're still making higher lows. So who's to say that this is not gonna be a pop all the way to recapture 866.14 as support? The most important line to watch out for right now is the sloping line of resistance in yellow. Why? Let's zoom in using a 15 minutes chart. Look at the importance and the reactions across this line as support and as resistance over and over and over and over again. If that line is lost again, then you know we're going to go down to retest the lows at around 728 and a half. Moving on to BTC, tulips, Bitcoin, what's going on here? All of a sudden, the regulation optimism which was bullshit to begin with, is gone. And I told you, it wasn't due to the regulation optimism. It was a technical rebound across the board. And now, poof, gone. Bitcoin did not even make it to 42,000 as support. So for now, we're not touching this chart. If anything, it's going to go down and retest 35,750 as support. Moving on. The AMC in hourly chart, the bear flag played out today, and we can argue that we're seeing another bear flag, which will take us down all the way to 14.24 support. And that is the line in the sand, at least for now. The apes will counter and say, and just like we're seeing in pretty much every chart out there, what if what we got today is a higher low pattern, indicating that we're not done yet? Of course, this argument goes down the toilet right away if the support 14.24 is revisited and most importantly lost. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the University of Michigan Consumers Sentiment Index. We also have the five years inflation expectations. All important indicators. But the most important thing I'm going to watch for is the VIX. If we see a down day, Will the VIX spike higher again? And if that is the case, then it will be a decisive win for the bears because we're going back to hedging and buying puts. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.